As I, as I told you, you have a lot of fans here. Uh, well, thank you so much for the introduction and uh, the great warm welcome that I've received already from your law school, great law school. Well, thank and you. Um, I've really enjoyed the day so far, and I'm sure I'll enjoy this conversation too. Well, I'm so grateful that you're here. Um, so uh, I, I first want to start off by asking you, um, your path to the Supreme Court uh, ran through academia. Um, you were an academic first. Uh, and in fact, you were the first nominee to the court without prior judicial experience since Justice Rehnquist was nominated 50 years earlier. How does your academic background shape your perspective on the court? And do you think it gives you a different perspective than your colleagues? You know, I'm not sure. Um, the court has actually had many people who have served a, a great deal of their uh, career in academia. Um, so they were all judges, uh, 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 and I wasn't. But of course, uh, Justice Barrett um, is essentially an academic. And um, we're the only two on the court now, I think. But um, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, Justice Ginsburg, um, her formative years were spent in academia at Columbia Law School, Justice Breyer at Harvard Law School, Justice Scalia at the University of Virginia Law School. So the court has had plenty of academics in its time. And uh, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, I'm, uh, in terms of, you can tell from those people, they're, they're very different kinds of judges. They're uh, very different in the decisions they made. So yeah, there are all kinds of academics in the world, and I'm not sure that academic background uh, leads to a particular kind of judge. I'll tell you the way I think it's affected me most, and it's, uh, it's not the scholarship I did or the academic environment uh, generally. It's, it's actually the experience of teaching, mm -hmm. and the way that has affected me is um, when I write my opinions, I try hard to figure out how it is that I'm going to explain things to people because, you know, Law is complicated, and law is often arcane, especially as when I started the court and I was a junior justice, I got all these really super arcane technical opinions uh, to write. That's the, the thing that junior justices tend to do, tend to get. And, uh, and, and, but I, I wanted ordinary people to understand them. I wanted not just legal specialists to understand them. I wanted non-lawyers to understand them, and uh, you, you know, I, you don't want to dumb them down so that absolutely everybody can understand them at the expense of um, the legal precision and and uh, sophistication. But but uh, I wanted to figure out a way to present ideas in, in in a way that they were comprehensible to people, because you know, in the end, this is a democracy, and people in a democracy should be able to understand how our institutions of government work, including the courts. Um, and the best way I knew to do that was when I sat down to write an opinion, I would think about sitting down to prepare a class. Because there, when, when you're preparing a class, you know, you're imagining going into a room of, of smart people, engaged people, but people who, at that moment, before they've had the class, they don't know all that much about what you're going to teach them. Maybe a little bit, but, but, but it's important to figure out, you know, how to present ideas, including complicated ideas to people, in a way that they'll understand it at the time and in a way that will also stick um, so that when they look back later, whether it's for studying for the exam or whether it's years later, you know, they'll remember something of what you told them. And I think you develop certain habits, uh, good teachers do. I like to think I was a good teacher of how to do that, how to explain things to people in a way that will be understandable and sticky. And, uh, and I try to think of that when I write opinions. And so I'm very much sort of approaching my opinion writing task as a teacher, which is of course what I did in two law schools. Yeah, yeah but you were also a dean, and as a dean, I'm, I'm wondering if you learned anything about uh, <laughs> judging from that job. Uh, whether I learned anything about judging from being a dean, I mean, I, I think a dean, I think you, you know, you think about an institution as a dean. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I wasn't already, being a dean made me into an institutionalist. I care about the, inst the, the, the future of the institution that I'm in. I try 
hard to do what I can um, uh, among the nine of us to make the institution work better. Uh, I, I try hard to pay attention to relationships in the way that deans have to pay attention to relationships. Um, um, uh, you know, maybe the, the small p politics of institutions, which I think all institutions have, is a thing that I hope I'm attentive to because of that deanship experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, that only goes, takes you so far. Mm -hmm. but, um, but, you know, I think, uh, uh, I, I like to think of myself as uh, an institutionalist that, you know, that wants to make the court is a multi-member body and wants to make it work as a multi-member body where, um, uh, where we can reach good decisions, um, where we can achieve consensus as far as we can, uh, where we can make principled compromises as far as we can, consistent with our obligation to uh, interpret and expound the law as we see it. And, uh, and I think that those instincts, which I hope I have, are ones that maybe um, were important as a dean. Does that make yeah. sense as a dean? Yeah. Well, it does. Yeah. <laughs> so um, in addition to being an academic and a dean, you were also the Solicitor General of the United States, what we sometimes in law refer to as the Tenth Justice. Can you say a little bit about what that experience taught you and how that might guide you um, on the court? Yeah, it's the coolest job in the world. Um, and, you know, honestly, if you could really plan out your career, I would have um, loved to have spent a few more years there. But, you know, when the president calls and says he's ready to appoint you to the Supreme Court, I think it's the wrong answer to say I'd really like to be Solicitor General for a few more years. <laughs> um, it's why um, uh, when you said uh, you're the only one who wasn't a judge, which is true, um, it used to be the case, by the way, that the court was full of uh, people, law lawyers who hadn't been judges. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, for example, if you look back to the Brown v. Board Court, mm -hmm. the Brown v. Board Court did not have a single justice on it who had been a judge previously. Um, Chief Justice Rehnquist had never been a uh, a judge previously, as, as you uh, said. Um, and we've gotten away from that. I think we've gotten away from it mostly because of the nomination and confirmation process that um, people, presidents, uh, very much want to know what their nominees are going to do. And the court has become a little bit more or a lot more, something that, you know, presidents want to make sure that their nominees are not going to surprise them. And the best way for a nominee not to surprise them is to have an extensive judicial record so that the president can look at that and, uh, and say, ah, that's, that's what they're going to be like as a judge. But, um, you know, from the standpoint of the court, I'm not sure that, um, you know, the court did very well for many years uh, without everybody uh, being a judge before. It's, it's not rocket science, you know, if you're a good lawyer and you're, engaged in the law and, um, uh, and you have judicial temperament and you have a proper understanding of what the judicial role is, um, uh, then I think you're going to be a good judge. But to the extent that, you know, there were experiences about, about, uh, about serving on a court that I didn't have, which there were. I mean, my first year was very much a learning experience. The learning curve was high. But I will say that the experience of being Solicitor General was, was su you know, superb preparation for being on the court itself. Because what the Solicitor General does, those who don't know, when I said it's the coolest job in the world, it really is. It's the person in the Justice Department who basically has responsibility for all the appellate work of the United States. So um, the Solicitor General de uh, decides um, what to appeal, um, what tr uh, trial judgments to appeal uh, on behalf of the United States. And then uh, the Solicitor General also decides what cases to take to the Supreme Court. And some of the cases that the Solicitor General and her office engages in are cases where the United States is a party. But in addition, in the Supreme Court and to some extent in appellate courts, uh, the United States functions as an amicus, which means a friend of the court. 
and, uh, and essentially is there to represent the uh, U.S. government's interests, even in cases in which they're not directly participating. So, um, so if you assume that the Supreme Court, for example, has 60 cases a year, uh, probably the Solicitor General, in one capacity or another, either as a party or as um, uh, an, an amicus, will uh, take part in 45 of them, 50 of them, the, the, the great majority. Um, so what, what the Solicitor General does is, uh, you know, make all these appellate decisions, and that's a fun part of the job, um, deciding which cases to appeal and what arguments you're going to bring forward. But in particular, in the Supreme Court, you're, uh, you know, um, uh, your office is arguing um, a substantial majority of the cases, and you're arguing um, uh, some of those. And so every month, the Solicitor General goes up to the Supreme Court and gets at the podium and argues whatever the most important case of the month is. And, uh, and also, the solicitor, all the briefs flow through the Solicitor General so that, the solicitor, so that uh, she's responsible for you know, thinking about how to argue all these cases before th the court, what arguments are going to be presented. Um, and so all my job, basically, was trying to figure out how to convince these nine people of the United States' position on various matters. So, so I guess the job was first to decide often what the U.S. position was and then to think how you were going to persuade the court to adopt it. So when I got to the court, I used to think, well, the job really hasn't changed because, you know, before I was trying to persuade nine people and now I'm just trying to persuade eight people. Yeah. But <laughs> it was the same basic job. Yeah. And it was, uh, you know, by, by the time I finished my tenure as Solicitor General, I knew all about the court's procedures and I knew a lot about the court's personalities. And, uh, and I had seen the court in action and really had been focused uh, in my thinking on the court and what made it tick and what was likely to persuade it and what was likely not to. And uh, so when I got to the court, again, there were lots of things I had to learn, but, uh, but it felt like very good preparation. Oh, great. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, the confirmation process. And uh, in your confirmation hearings in 2010, you famously said, we're all originalists. Can you explain what you meant by that, and is it still true? Yeah, so um, I actually didn't, that's, that's a, a, a sub, uh, that's only part of the sentence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and since everybody knows that part, it's nice that you gave me the opportunity to tell you the other part and what it meant. Um, the sentence goes, so, so in that sense, we're all originalists now. Well, you can tell from that, in that sense, that it was a more complicated statement. Um, it came after a long discussion about why I was not an originalist in the conventional understanding of that term. Um, but instead, why I thought that constitutional meaning uh, evolved, developed over time. And why that was consistent with, consonant with, what the framers wanted and, um, and, and, the, and consistent with the document that they gave us. Um, and so the, in that sense, was like, no, I'm not an originalist as some people would define it, but in fact, my view that constitutional meaning is involved, evolves is consistent with the actual original understanding of what the document was meant to do and how it was meant to work. So with that off the table, that stupid sound bite that has been hanging over my head for a while. <laughs> I'll tell you why I think that the, the Constitution evolves and how it does, and why that is consonant with what uh, they thought would happen. Um, uh, you know, take, take a document, and uh, we, we, you know, there are some parts of the Constitution that are very specific. So it says, nobody under 35 can be president. Well, everybody agrees on something like that, that, well, if you're not 35, you can't be president. And nobody goes any further than that, and everybody is willing to accept that, and 
Nobody says, you know, 35 was something different then than it is now, and maybe it should be 50, or, you know, it, it, okay. But a lot of the Constitution is nothing like that. A lot of the Constitution is these broad, general phrases. So, for example, if you look at the 14th Amendment, which is where a lot of the law we, uh, the constitutional law that people care about comes from, uh, the, Constitu the 14th Amendment says that people shall be granted due process of law. And it says that people shall be granted equal protection of the laws. And so the question becomes, how do we interpret those phrases and how do we decide what those phrases mean? Now, the originalist position, it's, um, there are different forms of originalism and everything's very complicated and, uh, you know, I don't want to simplify too much. But in essence, the originalist position is we look at what those phrases meant at the time. So there it was, you know, in the late 1860s, we look at what people thought it meant to have equal protection of the laws or to have due process of law. And those set of uh, applications, if you will, are the applications that we should continue and nothing else, all right? Um, but the first thing about that is that it's really hard to figure that out. I mean, lawyers, judges, are not historians. History is hard. And, and that kind of constitutional history, trying to figure out what words meant to people as to, you know, what the words applied to and what the words didn't, that kind of, I don't know, even intellectual history, let's call it, is a pretty impossible task. And you see this, honestly, in the court's opinions in the originalist vein, because, uh, you know, one person's history has a historical argument saying A, and another person has a historical argument saying not A. And both of them are seeming to pick and choose from the historical record, sort of to cherry pick. Justice Scalia called it picking out your friends in a crowd when he talked about legislative history. And, uh, and so the history is hard. It's, uh, it's, it's rare in these cases that we can know with any certainty um, what these, how these particular words were understood and how, uh, you know, what they required and what they did not require at the exact time in question. But maybe the even more important point and the thing that I was trying to say in that nomination hearing is that um, I don't think that the framers thought and I don't think we should think that that's the question. What did equal protection of the laws mean in 1868? I mean, nobody would have used phrases like that if they had just meant to codify a particular set of practices. Um, they would have codified a particular set of practices. These people, well, they were speaking for the ages, and they knew it. And they were speaking, all of these people, people in the original founding period and then af after the Civil War, I mean, if there was anybody who understood how the world changes, it was those people, how societies change, how governments change, how people change. They had brought on a revolution. They had lived a civil war. They had no doubt that societies changed and understandings changed. And they spoke in those phrases because they wanted the Constitution to be fit to govern a people as that people lived over time. Now, that doesn't ma mean that, you know, there are no moorings, there are no bearings. Quite the opposite. The original understanding is important. So, too, is the broader structure of our history. So, too, is the particular precedence that the court has used. So you always have to think about anchoring and, uh, 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 you know, not going off on just saying, well, it's, if we don't, we can just make it up. We can't just make it up. Lawyers have, to, judges have to be disciplined. Judges have to be constrained. But the project is not to figure out what they thought, and this again is an example, but it's an important one, equal protection of the laws meant in 1868. That wasn't the founders' own project. And they were right about that. I mean, Think about the kinds of rules that we would have to live under if that were the project. I mean, I gotta tell you, Dean, the two of us would not be sitting up here having this conversation in 1868. No. So 
you know, I mean, just to take a couple of concrete examples, uh, there was nobody that thought that in 1868 that equal protection of the laws uh, um, prohibited segregated schools. I, I mean, there have been some arguments in this van. They're not convincing. Um, uh, as, Brown, as Brown itself made very clear, um, uh, you know, there, there, was, there, there is not an originalist argument for, for the prohibition of segregation in education. Uh, or not a good one, at least. And similarly, that Equal Protection Clause, that so didn't apply to women. Women wanted themselves to be protected uh, uh, in the Equal Protection Clause, and there was a specific decision made uh, not to have anything about women, and indeed sort of to suggest that this didn't have, really didn't have anything, because people did want it to be entirely race-focused. So if you just looked at uh, 1868, women have no legal rights emerging from the Equal Protection Clause. So I don't think, I could go on and on about different things that, uh, you know, are, are accepted by pretty much everybody now um, that, that we would have to ditch if, the, um, if we really were true to this, like, no, we just do it the way they did it in the founding period. Um, I don't think that we could live with that. I don't think the framers wanted us to live with that. Again, that doesn't mean that you can do anything you want. Constraint and discipline and incrementalism, what we might call minimalism, are really important judicial values. Uh, and and the, 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 uh, the reason originalism caught on was really because of that, because people thought the judges were kind of making it up. Judges were imposing their own personal preferences. And that is a totally legitimate concern. And you have to figure out ways to prevent that from happening. But I think, as I say, a more multivarious approach, um, uh, an approach which thinks about uh, law as it develops over time, thinks about sticking close to precedent, thinks about a certain kind of incrementalism in judicial decision making, uh, that's the way to be truly constrained. So you mentioned precedent as a way to discipline uh, uh, courts, and you've been a steadfast defender of stare decisis, most notably in your uh, majority opinion in Kimball versus Marvel. In the, in the recent decisions in Dobbs and um, Students for uh, uh, Fair Admissions, a majority of the court voted to overrule precedent. Is precedent and stare decisis becoming an ideological dividing line in the court? Um, well, I surely hope not. And, um, uh, you know, I, I mean, you are right that there have been times recently where there have been ideological divides with uh, one side overturning precedent. Um, you know, I don't think, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that it won't have that year after year, case after case. At least it shouldn't, because the idea of precedent is of incredible importance to the development of law. And, and, and maybe I'll say a few words about why that's so. <clears throat> um, so the idea of precedence, it's a kind of counterintuitive idea, really. It says that because the court did something in the past, uh, it should continue to do the same thing, even if that thing was wrong in its original formulation. Because if it was right in its original formulation, of course, precedent does no work. You don't need precedent. Where the idea of stare decisis comes in is saying, even if you think it may have been wrong, or even if you think it was wrong, uh, there is still value in sticking to the course that was laid out. So people say, like, well, why would you do that if you think it may have been wrong, or if it was wrong, why not just change it? And uh, there are a few reasons for that. Well, I mean, one reason is just humility. Uh, stare decisis is a doctrine of humility. It basically says, you know, I'm one judge at one time, and if there have been many other judges over a course of many years, 
then I owe those people some deference, some respect, because I might be wrong. So story decisive humility is a good value in the law. You know, the judges don't think that they know everything and can do everything. And story decisis is basically a doctrine of humility. It's also a doctrine of stability and uh, of, um, uh, of, of reliance. So, you know, um, it, it keeps law stable, and it means that people who relied on a particular legal rule or principle um, don't have the rug pulled out from under them. So it's not like you have a right one day and then you don't have the right the next day. It's not like you own a piece of property one day and then you don't own a piece of property the next day. Um, so uh, stability and, um, and attention to reliance interests are of crucial importance in the law. And then finally, I would say um, uh, a precedent is important. Adherence to precedent is important because it prevents the court from looking like a political actor, like an ideologically driven actor. And the reason is because, uh, you know, I think what happens when courts just overrule things willy-nilly, it's usually because, um, or sometimes it's because, new judges have come on the scene. And then they say, well, you know, we never liked this rule. We were not part of creating this rule, and we never liked it, so we're going to overturn it. But when that happens, the court um, looks as though it's just a matter of who's on the court, you know? What judges happen to be there on any given day? And that doesn't look very law-like to people. And it's a crucial thing about our legal institutions that the public have confidence in them and that that confidence is of a particular kind. I think people have no right to expect that they're going to agree with all the decisions that courts make. I mean, quite the contrary. Very often, courts have to do things which a majority of the public doesn't like. But people do want courts and have a right to expect that courts act like courts and that they don't look like other political actors, you know, or they, they don't look like the other parts of our government which are made up of political actors, that they look as though they're doing something different. When the court kind of goes back and forth, uh, and, and our precedent, law about precedent talks about this quite a lot, uh, it makes people think that courts are just sort of making it up on the fly. And that's an extremely damaging thing for the judicial system and uh, I think for our country. I'd like to ask um, about the court's role with regard to um, our political and, and democratic uh, processes. So in, um, in Brnovich versus the Democratic National Committee, your dissent defended the Voting Rights Act against Arizona's out-of-precinct law, where you argued that minority vo voters were disproportionately likely to have their votes thrown out by that law. Do you think that the Voting Rights Act ought to be read more liberally to afford special protections to minority voters? I don't think the Voting Rights Act ought to be made more liberally than what it was actually written as. In other words, you know, there are some people that sometimes uh, they say, well, uh, you should give some kinds of statutes a liberal reading. I, I don't think that that's the case uh, generally, and I don't think that it's the case with the Voting Rights Act. What you should do is you should read statutes fairly. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why the court got it wrong was not because it didn't put a thumb on the scales, was not because it didn't read the Voting Rights Act liberally, it was because it didn't read the Voting Rights Act fairly. It didn't uh, understand that the Voting Rights Act was one of the most expansive, broad, far-reaching pieces of legislation that Congress has ever passed in this country. Uh, what it did was give a kind of crabbed reading to the Voting Rights Act. It, it um, uh, uh, unnaturally restricted, constricted it. Um, uh, if the Voting Rights Act was read fairly, uh, that decision, I said in my dissent, would have come out the other way. That decision, you know, was pretty, the Voting Rights Act was pretty clear that uh, what it was doing was ensuring that everybody had um, an equivalent right to vote, that, and that everybody's vote counted in the same way, so that impediments to voting, obstacles to voting, schemes that diluted some people's votes 
as compared to other people's votes on the basis of race um, were forbidden. And, um, uh, you know, that responded to a very dire, horrible history in this country of preventing black Americans especially um, from accessing the polls and from having their vote count in the same way as, uh, as white Americans vote. And uh, I th the, the, the Voting Rights Act was passed by Congress as a very powerful indictment of that practice. And, um, and you know, in my view, read in the way it was written, which is to say read fairly, read as they wrote it, it would have prohibited the practices in that case. Let's talk about another practice that affects uh, democracy, and that's uh, gerrymandering. Um, in a case, uh, Rucho versus Common Cause, your dissent lamented the court's refusal to remedy the constitutional violation of partisan gerrymandering that, in your words, deprives citizens of the most fundamental of their constitutional rights, the rights to participate equally in the political process, and that the gerrymandering in that case debased and dishonored our democracy. The, the majority in that case held that the gerrymanders involved political questions beyond the reach of federal courts. If that's true, then what's the role of courts in policing the democratic process? Yeah, I think the, um, the, the, the point of the dissent was that it's not true, that, uh, that uh, courts indeed can play a role and, um, and uh, have a role in, in this process. So let me tell you a little bit about why. And then as to, like, what else can we do? I mean, it is still the case that uh, state courts using state constitutions can try to prevent partisan gerrymanders, and uh, many of them have and do. Um, but with respect to that opinion, which was about um, uh, 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 courts under the federal constitution, I mean, what was striking about that case was it was a case in which everybody agreed that the gerrymandering involved did violate the Constitution. There was really no argument that it didn't violate the Constitution. So these were cases in which, you know, it could be, I mean, you can imagine different kinds of gerrymanders. You know, you take a, a place, a state, let's say, where people are roughly divided. You know, some, you know, half like Republicans, half like Democrats. But then the district lines are drawn so that it's wildly out of proportion. And, you know, of uh, 13 seats, 10 go to one party, and the uh, three go to the other. That was one of the gerrymanders that was involved in this case. Another of the gerrymanders was basically, um, it was in a state where there were many more Democrats than Republicans, but it deprived Republicans of uh, any ability to elect even one representative of, um, in the entire state. So they can work in different ways, but, uh, but essentially what they do, and we had before us one Republican gerrymander and one Democratic gerrymander, so the shoe was on both feet. And what um, the legislatures had tried to do was just to prevent people who um, uh, supported the opposite party from really having any f uh, fair shot um, to get um, uh, representatives of their choice elected. Um, in, in, um, in the appropriate number of districts. Now, what is the appropriate number of districts is a hard call. And the Chief Justice, who wrote the majority opinion, made a persuasive case, I agree with it, that you can't have courts, like, looking at every single district line and figuring out, do you, you know, should this be a 6-7 gerrymander? You know, should this be a 6-7 split? Or should it be a, 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 an 8-5 split? You know, but, but, but there was no need to do that in this case because what the courts below had done was basically create a series of mechanisms to prevent extreme gerrymanders. So there was a lot of room around the edges for the political process to work. There was a lot of room for um, uh, politicians to engage in the kind of age-old practice of drawing lines and of um, making political judgments about how districting should operate. But there were these mechanisms to prevent completely extreme gerrymanders. And uh, the majority opinion said, 
you know, even that is too much for courts. The courts just shouldn't be involved in it. And I, I thought that that was a wrong decision, that um, many of the lower courts had shown that it was uh, really possible to separate out the really bad gerrymanders from others. And, you know, what is striking about the opinion is that it allows what everybody understands as a constitutional violation to go forward because of a judgment that courts can't do anything about it. I think that that's wrong. And I'll just say, and this, um, you know, this is a, you're asking me these questions, I guess, because it's, it's about the future of democracy. I think if there's one thing that courts appropriately do, I mean, I think that there are so many things where courts should stay their hand, where courts should be restrained, where courts should say, we want to let the political process work. We want to, you know, we want to leave this to actors who um, are elected by the American people. But the one place where the court has most responsibility is to actually protect the mechanisms of democracy itself. So that if the democratic system is structured in a fair way, if the rules are fair, and primarily that means if everybody's vote is, is counted and is relatively equal to every other person's vote, um, then you let the democratic process work and whatever outcomes it produces, it produces. But the necessary thing is to make sure that the rules of the democratic process aren't completely skewed from the outset. Because if the rules are skewed from the outset, well then the results are going to be skewed and indeed illegitimate. So if there's one place where the court has a role that the court should not be embarrassed about taking, it is to protect the institutions of representative government. And that's why, I mean, I honestly thought that this uh, dissent was the uh, most important one I've ever written. Um, uh, and that, you know, that, that, uh, that, that this, um, uh, the, the decision made me very sad. Um, I want to ask you about another case. Um, and that's the, uh, the recent uh, student loan forgiveness case, uh, Biden versus Nebraska. In that case, Chief Justice Roberts ends the majority opinion striking down the Biden administration's student uh, loan forgiveness program by referring to your dissent as follows. It has become a disturbing feature of some recent opinions to criticize the decisions with, with which they disagree as going beyond the proper role of the judiciary. We have employed the traditional tools of judicial decision making in doing so. Reasonable minds may disagree with our analysis, and in fact, at least three do. We do not mistake this plainly heartfelt disagreement for disparagement. It is important that the public not be misled either. Any misperception would be harmful to this institution and our country. And then you respond to the Chief Justice by, uh, by writing, from the first page to the last, today's opinion departs from the demands of judicial restraint. At the behest of a party that has suffered no injury, the majority decides a contested public policy issue properly belonging to the politically accountable branches and the people they represent. In saying so, and saying so strongly, I do not at all disparage those who disagree. The majority is right to make that point as well as to say reasonable minds are found on both sides of this case. And there is surely nothing personal in the dispute here, but justices throughout history have raised the alarm when the court has overreached, when it has exceeded its proper limited role in our nation's governance. It would not have been disturbing and indeed damaging if they had not. I mean, it would have been uh, disturbing and indeed damaging if they had not. The same is true in our own day. I don't think I have ever read such an exchange between a majority opinion and a dissent before with the majority criticizing the mode of criticism of uh, the dissent. Is there some unspoken concern here that prompted this exchange? Uh, was either of you worried that the public might misunderstand the, the disagreement or the tone of either opinion? Uh, well, I feel like to provide a full answer to that question, we should have the Chief Justice here. <laughs> here beside me, we could both give our respective answers for our respective parts of the exchange. Um, uh, 
you know, I, 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 uh, here's what I would say. I would say I agree with um, one of the things that the Chief Justice said, and I disagree with the other. So I'll start with the disagreement. Um, read me the first sentence of the Chief Justice's opinion again. He says, it's become a disturbing feature of some recent opinions to criticize the decisions with which they disagree. Okay. As, oh, oh, go ahead. As going, oh, as, I'm going, sorry. as going beyond the proper role of the judiciary. Yeah. Disturbing to criticize decisions as going beyond the proper role of the judiciary. I don't think that that's disturbing at all. As I said, I think it would be disturbing of a dissent that thought that the court had gone beyond the proper role of the judiciary. Um, it would be disturbing if you didn't say that, if you pulled your punches, if you said we're going to look the other way, if you said, um, you know, I believe that the court has gone beyond the proper role of the judiciary, has trespassed on other institutions' prerogatives, um, has, has been a court that has not acted like a court, and yet I'm not going to say anything. I think that that's what would be disturbing, is pulling your punches in that way. I do think, I mean, on the other hand, here's what I do agree with the Chief Justice on. I mean, I do think, yes, to the extent that he was concerned, look, this was, I wrote a strong dissent. You know, it was a, it was a strongly worded dissent. This is what I thought about that case. It's a little bit summarized in that passage that you read. I thought that the case should never have been before the court. We have rules called standing rules, which um, uh, uh, require that people who come to the court with constitutional complaints have themselves suffered injury of some kind. The plaintiffs before us, I thought, had not suffered a constitutional injury. They were uh, states who were complaining about the Biden administration's loan forgiveness program. And, you know, the fact that a lot of students or former students had gotten more money might be bad policy, it might be good policy, but it was really hard to see how the states were injured by that. Um, uh, these were policy preferences by the state. They thought it was bad policy. So they came in and uh, they brought a suit. But we're not supposed to allow that to happen, to allow policy disagreements to become um, uh, uh, legal cases. And, uh, and I also thought, uh, even putting that aside, that the decision was wrong substantively, that if you looked at the statute, the statute gave the uh, Department of Education the ability to make these kinds of calls when uh, emergencies occurred, that the Department of Education had used that authority just as Congress had expected it might be used. And so we were wrong as a substantive matter as well. So I really thought that the court was, uh, was wrong to allow the case in the first place, and then that the court had basically trespassed on the prerogatives of the uh, politically accountable branches to make policy. And again, uh, the policy may have been stupid policy, you know, but it wasn't our role to say that uh, if that's what the politically accountable branches had done by way of a statute and then uh, an administrative rule. So I said that the court had not acted like a court. Now, it's not a pleasant thing to be told that. I mean, when I'm told that by other justices, I don't like it either. And um, uh, so, uh, you know, but that's sort of the nature of the business, is that uh, in our judicial system, there are judicial systems where there are no dissents, that once somebody loses, they just pack up and go home. Our judicial system has followed a different course, and I think rightly so. Our judicial system says we want to hold majorities to account. Um, uh, we want to allow people to express their disagreement so that maybe when the next case comes along, the same mistakes are not made, so that maybe when the, you know, in years to come, um, uh, the court can, the law can go in a different direction, and that's why dissents are important. And so, again, like, I, I, I just disagree that it's not in the nature of dissents. Uh, some of the most important dissents of, of our country's history have been about why the court has overstepped its role. What I do agree with the Chief Justice on is that nobody should take that as personal in any way. I mean, uh, I admire the Chief Justice enormously. I admire him as a person. I admire him as a judge. Um, uh, I admire him as the uh, institutional leader of the court. So this was, there was nothing personal about this, and there was no 
I think his word was disparagement about this. Um, and, 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 you know, I mean, to the extent that he thought, well, people don't understand when they read a point, counterpoint like this, that you can say both those things, that, you know, I vigorously disagree with the decision he reached, but that I admire him as a judge. People don't understand this, and I'm trying to suggest that both of those things can be true. Uh, I agree with that. I mean, both of those things can be true, and people should understand that as well. So I want to talk about that a little bit more. So there's a lot of focus on disagreements like that in the court and, and in the press in particular. Um, there's this picture of, a, of an ideologically or politically divided court. But there are a lot of um, opinions where uh, there are 9-0 opinion, opinions where you're all in agreement. And there are a lot of other opinions where um, it's not clear that you could, you could um, uh, see any particular ideological divide between uh, the justices. Can you give an example of, uh, of cases where um, you can't really predict how the, the justices would come out uh, on the basis of who appointed them? And, and why, why don't those cases get more attention from the press? Yeah, I mean, for sure there are cases like that. Um, I mean, first off, you know, we probably do 30, 40 percent. It varies by the year, but 30, 40 percent of opinions unanimously, so where we all agree um, across every divide that you can come up with. Um, and then there are cases where um, uh, we're sort of scrambled up in unpredictable and hard to explain ways. Um, I, was, I was preparing for the, uh, uh, our, our, our first conference of the year uh, the other day, and I noticed that there were some petitions that have to do with how to understand the confrontation clause, which is the clause that, allow, that, that, that allows a, a criminal defendant to confront the witnesses against um, him. And it turns out that, you know, justices on the court have been all over the map on that, and uh, not in any kind of ways that would strike a person as like, oh, of course, it's six to three or something like that. I mean, just like everything's scrambled up, uh, usual allies aren't allies, usual people across the V are on the same side of the V. Uh, so there definitely are things like that, and perhaps people uh, don't notice them quite as much um, uh, as the more easy to explain uh, used to be 5-4, now 6-3 opinions. Um, occasionally people notice them. I'll just say uh, Justice Sotomayor got into a very, uh, Justice Sotomayor and I got into a very vigorous back and forth um, in a case about an Andy Warhol silk screen and whether it was uh, constituted fair use or whether the Andy Warhol Foundation had to pay uh, a photographer whose photograph he had used. And it got an enormous amount of press. <coughs> and partly it's because it was kind of a fun case involving art, but partly I think it was because, oh, like here are these two women who often agree with each other fighting. Um, <laughs> so sometimes that, uh, and, and we fought pretty vig vigorously, you know. Uh, so sometimes that exact, like, oh, the usual allies aren't doing with the huge, I mean, there are plenty of cases where Justice Sotomayor and I uh, disagree, but it was like, oh, let's, let's watch them catfight or something like that. <laughs> um, but, you know, as to why maybe those cases usually get less attention, I mean, I think, you know, t to be completely honest, I mean, it has to be said that some of the more important cases do fall along pretty predictable lines. And... Not all of them, and, uh, but, um, but when, you know, in the course of a couple of years, you have um, a case, in, uh, just like last year, a case uh, uh, prohibiting the use of affirmative action, an important case involving uh, LBGTQ uh, rights, uh, this student loan case, the prior year, uh, you had um, uh, the right to abortion um, uh, uh, overturned. Uh, you had a very important case about climate change and the ability of the government to combat climate change. And when all of these are 
falling six to three, you know, it's, it doesn't strike me as surprising that people would talk about that. So um, uh, I want to <laughs> ask about, uh, we're, we're here at Notre Dame, a faith-based institution. I want to ask about the role of faith in your life and, and in your professional career. Can you tell us a little bit. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's surely important in my life. I'm Jewish. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, you know, a, a practicing Jew. It's important to me religiously and culturally. Um, and, you know, I'm steeped in, uh, you know, I was uh, from an early age steeped in the history of the Jewish people. And um, uh, I went to Hebrew school for a lot, a lot of years and continued to go to synagogue on um, – uh, many occasions, and you're catching me now in, um, so last weekend I spent all weekend in synagogue, and after I go, I, after I'm here and I go to your football game, <laughs> uh, this coming week, uh, Sunday, Sunday and Monday, I'll spend uh, uh, all those days in synagogue. This is the most holy day of the Jewish year. They're called the Days of Awe which is the opportunity for Jews to reflect and repent and get square with, uh, you know, get your relationship right with God and get your relationship right with other human beings. And it's a time when I reflect a lot about uh, my religious life and my religious practice and, 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 uh, and how it can help me to be a better person. Um, so... Uh, so, you know, my, my uh, Judaism is uh, important to me as a human being. Uh, I try not to make it important to me as a judge. I try um, to keep the one thing separate from the other. Um, you know, when you think about what religions are and what they do, uh, you know, they're systems of morality. They're codes of morality. Certainly the Jewish religion is full of moral and ethical precepts and, um, but, but those uh, precepts of morality, just like any others, uh, I think, you know, that's personal morality. And it would be improper for me to substitute my personal morality for the legal rules that I'm supposed to enforce, for the provisions of law that I'm supposed to interpret. So, uh, so being Jewish is super important to my life, but I hope that being Jewish is, is uh, of no importance to my judging. So you mentioned codes of morality, codes of ethics, and right now we, we, uh, we see in the press, certainly, um, there's a lot of uh, talk and conversation about a code of ethics for the court and, uh, and the justices, and um, uh, um, uh, uh, there's scrutiny over the justices' relationships with particular parties or, or even with law schools. Uh, and, and law school teaching. Um, do we need a code of ethics for the court? Well, look, I, I, you know, this is, uh, as a number of people have discussed recently, been a subject of conversation in the court. Um, the Chief Justice recently gave a speech in which he said that the Supreme Court, you know, um, uh, had to be held, and he was committed to making sure it was to the highest standards of conduct. That's got to be right. Um, uh, and uh, right now, we're in a situation where we've committed to following certain kinds of ethical rules respecting judges, um, but, uh, but have said we will only be guided by others. So, you know, we've committed to following the gift rules that other judges follow and uh, the outside income rules that other judges follow. But other judges have a very extensive code of ethics that um, governs everything that they do. And there's been some concern, and I think it's legitimate concern, that, not, uh, that the Supreme Court is, a, is, a, is, is an unusual kind of court in certain respects, and that some of the rules do not fit quite as well in, at the Supreme Court level than they do at um, the level of lower courts. But, um, but of course, what we could do is just adapt the code of conduct that the other court systems have in order to refle reflect those, um, uh, 
slight or certain differences. And I think it would be a good thing for the court to do that. Um, it would, uh, you know, help in our own compliance with the rules, and it would, uh, uh, I think, go far in uh, persuading other people that we were um, adhering to the highest standards of conduct. Um, so, you know, I hope we can make progress. I know Justice Kavanaugh was recently uh, at an event where he said he thought we, um, we, we would in, um, uh, uh, you know, in a, um, soon. I'm not exactly sure how he phrased it, but, um, you know, I, uh, uh, I hope that that's true. Can you tell, tell us who the holdup is? No. <laughs> No, what goes in, what goes on in the conference room, goes on in the right. conference room, and right. you know, and, and I don't want to suggest that there's like one holdout. I mean, this is you know for various reasons, having to do with certain differences between the Supreme Court and other courts, and there are complicated issues here. Uh, there are you know totally good faith um, disagreements or concerns, if you will. Uh, there are some things to be worked out. You know, I hope we can get them worked out. I withdraw the question. Um, so you're arguably one of the best writers on the court. I think a lot of lawyers agree uh, that that's the case. Um, do you have any tips for young lawyers, law students, and young lawyers um, as to how they can write better? Well, first off, thank you. Um, so thank you very much for that compliment, I, um, whether or not it's true. Um, uh, first rule is edit, edit, edit. I mean, uh, there are really, really very few people, I'm certainly not one of them, um, whose first draft is, um, is a gift. Uh, y y you know, first drafts were meant to be succeeded by second drafts, which were meant to be succeeded by third drafts, and eventually things come into shape. So edit yourself, find good people to edit you. My clerks form a very important part of my writing process uh, by editing. Uh, my drafts, and um, and I know that they get better because uh, because they're outside readers going, this doesn't work, it doesn't work structurally or substantively, or the word choice is wrong, and and provide me with all those kinds of criticism. And drafts get better over time. So that's the first piece of advice. Uh, I think I guess the second piece of advice is read well. I'm a big believer in the fact that people who read good writing are more likely to sort of uh, absorb what that sounds like, what it feels like to write well themselves. Um, it also works conversely. There are, sometimes, there are sometimes I pick up briefs and I think every minute I spend with this brief, I become a worse writer. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes I pick up briefs and it's the opposite. So, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so read well. And uh, I don't know, I, th I think those are the two big Big things. Well, I know you're an avid reader, and I know that you're a fan of Jane Austen novels. But can you tell us what you might be reading now, and um, tell us anything about? Yeah. So oddly enough, um, and I, I have to admit that I told the dean this, which may lead to, which may have led to that question. So I'm on the plane, and I'm reading um, uh, this sort of popular history book called *Fever in the Heartland* which is a book about the Ku Klux Klan in the Midwest in the 1920s, and particularly in Indiana, where the um, Ku Klux Klan was very powerful in the 1920s, and in fact almost captured the State House. And uh, there I am on the plane, and it's like page 140, and there we are in South Bend. And um, you probably know this story, but I'll just tell it to whichever ones of you don't know this, you know, really quite great moment in the university's history, which is uh, the, the Ku Klux Klan of, of Indiana comes to South Bend to sort of put Notre Dame in its place, to make it clear that this Catholic institution, you know, should be wiped off the face of the earth. And, um, uh, and the students kind of organize against it. And there's this big kind of like what we would think of now as like a little bit of a demonstration and a counter demonstration. And the students basically rout the Ku Klux Klan, send them back out of South Bend. Uh, and this is the, the days of Newt Romney, Newt Romney and the Four Horsemen. 
and there's this part of the book which says that the quarterback of Notre Dame takes, they had a, they had a, a instead of a burning cross, the Ku Klux Klan had put up this cross with like red electric bulbs, you know, and the quarterback of Notre Dame starts throwing stones and just knocking out the, <laughs> the bulbs one by one. And, um, and uh, the students of Notre Dame send them packing. Where's so, that guy when we need him now? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Um, so uh, you spent a lot of years as a, as a, as a dean at Harvard. And uh, one of the things that's happening that we've seen happen around college campuses uh, in America uh, is the rise of cancel culture. And, uh, and with cancel culture, we've got uh, uh, a rise in uh, self-censorship. What do you see as ways that we can, as law schools or even as undergraduate institutions, um, combat cancel culture and create a, an environment where people feel free to speak their minds and and uh, and I often get asked by students how do they how do they take a free exchange culture out into the workplace with them? Yeah, well, I know what the goal is, and the goal is exactly the one that you suggested. I mean, there's too much um, disrupting speakers, there's too much banning books, there's too much. Uh, trying to insulate yourself from ideas with which you disagree uh, all around us. Um, and it exists on both sides of the political spectrum. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's wrong and it's counterproductive for our democracy and our society. Um, uh, I mean, for our democracy, you know, this nation can't work and can't do the things that it need to do, needs to do unless people can talk with each other and can um, uh, really try to understand each other and learn from each other and try to put their heads together and work for a, a common good, which, um, you know, presumably we all want this, this nation to prosper. And uh, it's not going to happen unless people work together across um, uh, various disagreements, profound as they might be. And I think uh, it's especially important uh, in educational institutions. Um, you know, educational institutions are supposed to be about learning and about exchange and about engagement with ideas, including ideas uh, you don't like. And, you know, if nothing else, nobody has ever managed to persuade a person who they don't understand. So put yourself in another person's shoes and try to figure out um, where that other person is coming from and why she thinks what she thinks. Uh, if nothing else, in order to persuade that person. But you might also learn from that person. And you might uh, uh, share something that you didn't realize you shared. And, um, and that sort of exchange is what universities, edu other educational institutions are all about. And I should say maybe especially law schools. I mean, um, uh, Stanford Law School recently had a very uh, bad episode with respect to one of these things. But one good thing that came out of that bad episode where um, a, a, a judge was disrupted and prevented from speaking, a conservative judge, um, one good thing that came out of that episode was I think a former colleague of yours wrote this letter to um, uh, her student body. And the letter is really quite eloquent about how law, especially as an institution, you know, it's all about confronting different points of view. And how are you going to do your job as a lawyer if you close your mind and close your ears to, to, um, to uh, different ideas? And ideas that you might find uh, enormously objectionable, but, um, but you can't operate well as a lawyer unless you can engage um, uh, those ideas, unless you understand them, unless you try to figure out what, um, why they're held by people and then you can go about trying uh, to uh, counter them. Um, uh, 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 um, but um, so, you know, education, law, and democracy in general, I think so much depend on this process of mutual engagement, of learning from each other, of um, listening to each other, um, of a, a, a kind of active engagement and persuasion that really does depend 
on thinking that other people are operating in good faith and that, um, uh, you know, um, there's, there's something to be learned from engaging with them. Um, I'm wondering if you could either confirm or deny a rumor that has been running rampant on this campus uh, this week. Um, as you may know, ESPN College Game Day is here tomorrow. <laughs> and some people think that you might be the guest celebrity picker. <laughs> Um, I think I'll deny. <laughs> I'm also aware, by the way, that I've ruined the wrong color. <laughs> <laughs> I, I realized that, you know, uh, you know, you come with what you come with, and I came with a red jacket, and I, uh, somebody pointed this out to me. I felt very bad about it. Then the person said, just tell them your heart is green. <laughs> so, okay, my heart's green. <laughs> well, if it's, if it's not, we've supplied you with plenty of green clothing for tomorrow. Um, one but not over the gift limit. <laughs> Yes. Okay, so I have one last question for you. Ohio State or Notre Dame? Well, I think I've already said Notre Dame. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Leave them clapping. Is my, uh... Just for that, I have a special gift for you. Um, also not over the gift limit. Thank you so much. I gotta move this out of the way. <laughs> thank you so much that for being here. That is so us. great. And thank you I so much this. for joining us. This is going up in my office. I hope so. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Oh, did you share it? Yeah, this one. <laughs>